how is this user behaving? Are they, as you said, lingering on images? Are they looking at a lot of images? Are those images for the same product or different products? Are they scrolling deeply on a page? Are they moving quickly through the funnel? So there's all that rich in-session data, which can be extremely uh, predictive. And then there's how that evolves over time. So are they coming back? Are they looking at the same products? Are they doing uh, sort of different things that deepen their search? And then we also look at product economics. So different categories have different uh, values to to the brand. And all of that gets crunched together in 15 milliseconds to say, boom, this user will rely is part of a population that will reliably convert at 65%. Welcome everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, managing partner of Interplay. I'm on a mission to help entrepreneurs advance society. And this podcast is a big part of that effort. On today's pod, I chat with Richard Harris, the founder and CEO of Black Crow. Black Crow is a no-code, real-time, machine learning-based predictive software that helps companies understand likely customer behavior. Now, Richard is a veteran entrepreneur and has been involved in the tech industry since the 90s. He cut his teeth in the consulting world and then moved over to be on the management team of Travelocity during the dot-com boom. He's gone on since then to start numerous other companies. As you'll hear him explain, the world is turning into a browser. Between mobile devices, computer, computers, wearable tech, self-driving cars, and everything else, real-time data is increasingly streaming from every part of our lives. He's using this insight, that data is coming from everywhere, to build a company to help startups and brands collect and understand first-party data so they can increase revenue and margins. In addition to talking about Black Crow and how it operates and the machine learning industry, we also dove into strategies that founders can deploy to navigate down market cycles like the one we're currently entering. He's been through three of these cycles and has some very helpful wisdom. So if you started your company after 2010, have a listen. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Bowery Legal. Bowery Legal provides a complete range of legal services to high growth companies. They do everything from formation, employment, partnership agreements, stock grants, corporate matters, and venture capital and debt financings. If you're interested in learning more, visit BoweryLegal.com. Richard, thanks for being here today, buddy. My pleasure, Mark. It's good to be with you. All right, let's jump in. Can you give us an overview of Black Crow? Sure. Uh, Black Crow is a real-time machine learning platform. And the key thing we do is we ingest massive amounts of data, process it in real time, and then produce predictions. And the key area where we work today is in e-commerce, e where in real time, as users are shopping in e-commerce environment, we predict their future value 15 milliseconds after anyone does anything inside of a brand's environment. How the hell does that work? That's, that sounds <laughs> too good to be true. It does. It does. Um, and it almost is, except that it's not. Um, so what we're doing, we've made, you know, the, the core of what we do is a very sophisticated real-time auto ML platform. And it was designed to be able to, um, you know, as I mentioned, ingest massive amounts of streaming data. So that's literally the event data that's kicked off by a user interacting with a website, with a browser. And historically, that has not been a widely solved problem. Streaming data, processing it, and generating predictions on top of it has not been a widely solved problem. So, you know, massive companies like Google uh, do stuff like this, like Amazon does stuff like this. But our particular mission is about making this accessible to the middle of the market. People who have historically not have access, not had access to Fortune 500 grade machine learning. But the key thing is, in order to get after that middle of the market, we needed to make it super simple. So rather than being a multi-year, multi-million dollar project, which is how it works at the Fortune 500 level, it's literally one click to install. And what our machine does is it just listens to all of that user uh, interaction data, all of those real-time events. And based on whatever the objective function is, meaning what is the key thing that this brand or store or e-commerce company is trying to have happen, whether that's a subscription or a uh, purchase, a repeat purchase, the machine starts finding the patterns in that without any work, frankly, on our side or on the customer's side. And in about two weeks, it will have a very 
um, accurate predictive model built so that every time someone does something, so 100% of visitors to a commerce environment, uh, the machine can say, how likely is this person uh, to do the thing you want them to do? So where's the signal in all this? Because I think about the stream of data flowing through, and I'm sure it varies by use case and by company and by customer. But I would just imagine a lot of it's noise. Is there an area where, hey, people who click on a certain area or a certain amount of time, is there something that's usually like a, a higher probability, pro- more probabilistic uh, signal in the data stream? Yeah, it's interesting. So we obviously look at this all the time. And uh, the answer is nothing that is consistent. Um, now, in the smallest possible sense, meaning there's no, there's nothing I could narrate to you in a human understandable way, or I couldn't narrate anything not understandable by humans. But when you try to find the story in the predictions, it's often not there. I can tell you though that you know the way we work, the machine is listening to about 450 signals um, in real time. And it's trying to understand what, if any, uh, of those signals are predictive, right? Can create predictive knowledge. And I'll say that, you know, for every brand that we work with, and we have our models running on about 240, 250 uh, different commerce brands right now. Um, there's none of them are the same. So each model is bes- is built in a bespoke way for each brand. And what the machine is trying to do is figure out which of those 450 signals uh, there after each user action is relevant for this brand. And then the weighting of each variable and trying to predict what their future behavior and value will be. But I'd say that the interesting thing is there's there's even though there's no human narrative story, what, what's so interesting is that this data that brands have, that commerce companies have, have um, is data they own. And historically, because it's so hard to process real-time streaming data, historically, they haven't really thought of it as an asset that they can exploit. And that's what we're trying to do is really using machine learning, which is the only way to, to understand when there's so much data, using machine learning. How do we turn this thing that they own into a huge asset, right? When you can predict what users are going to do and how valuable they're going to be, it kind of changes the game on a whole bunch of elements of a, of a commerce business. I mean, so this could be as simple as someone hovers over a picture and then clicks, hovers over the buy button. And those two things in conjunction over a huge amount of data sets, you and I won't see the pattern, but the machine will figure out that combined with two or three other things in a duration. Boom. This person's a high probability buyer. Yes. I mean, it's really as simple as that. Like, yeah, but I can tell you, but, but you're hitting on the right things, which is, you know, what kind of, what kind of event data is actually there. Right. And if you think about a user interacting with a brand the, there's a few different buckets, right? There's like, how did that user get to where they are with the brand, right? Where did they come from? Was it some sort of marketing campaign or did they just show up at the website or did they come through social? Um, you know, and then all the normal stuff you get when you're just integrated into a browser, like where are they? What time is it? What kind of device? You know, all that kind of stuff you get for free. So that's sort of one bucket. We call it like the referring data. But then there's the rich in session data, right? How does, how is this user behaving? Are they, as you said, lingering on images? Are they looking at a lot of images? Are those images for the same product or different products? Are they scrolling deeply on a page? Are they moving quickly through the funnel? Um, uh, so there's all that rich in session data, which can be extremely uh, predictive. And then there's how that evolves over time. So are they coming back? Are they looking at the same products? Are they doing uh, sort of different things that deepen their search? Um, and all of their past interactions with the brand. And then we also look at product economics. So different categories have different uh, values to, to the brand. And all of that gets crunched together in 15 milliseconds to say, boom, this user will rely, is part of a population that will reliably convert at 65%. Whereas That's another amazing. user may be part of a population that will convert at 0.02%. And when you just ask a brand like, hey, if you knew this in advance, if you had 10 deciles, you know, or low, medium, high, if you knew that someone was part of a population that will convert at 60% versus something close to 0%, what would you want to do differently? And then we get back an extremely long list because these brands kind of want to do everything differently, right? Certainly how they market, maybe how they price or offers promotions, UX, what they're merchandising, 
um, how they prioritize their customer service queue. Um, so there's so many elements of a business, how they text or email them. There's so many elements of a business that could be really optimized once you have this future knowledge, which hasn't been available till now. That's phenomenal. Can you, what can you extrapolate from that? Can, can you, can you get customer profiles to the point where before someone even lands or right when they land, you know, what bucket they're going to fit into, or they've got to come self-identify through behavior and then yeah, once no, so- they're on. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And we, uh, because we use only first party data, so we're not merging profiles, you know, stuff that, that like the ad tech business used to do. We're not involved in that in any way. We're literally just a data processor of that brand's own first party data. And so we have to be able, uh, to provide a pred- prediction on the first landing, right? The, from pixel zero, from the moment a user lands on a page. And we're able to do that. Obviously, the more data you have about a user's behavior, the more high fidelity that prediction gets. But we can de-average users from you know, anonymous users who just clear their cookies, et cetera, et cetera. Based on that real-time data, we're able to de-average them and provide a prediction better than just thinking about all your users on average, which is what most brands have been forced to do. Yeah. I mean, the idea of segmenting the customers down this way is not the typical way you talk about it in marketing, right? Customer segmentation... No usually is based around some sort of high-level conceptual demographic, like a geography yep. or something yep. else. Thinking about... That's right. Or it's like yeah. some psychographic, like these are empty nesters or right. you know, nomadic millennials or whatever. And it's sort of like, okay, that's interesting. But what really do you want to do? Like you can kind of make stuff up about what you'd want to do differently for a baby boomer or a, a nomadic millennial. But ultimately, you're a brand trying to create a relationship with the user centered around this product, whatever value you're delivering to the user. And how valuable they are to you as a brand, it's kind of like the number one factor, right? Um, uh, from which decisions should be made. And now they can be made in real time. Now, the behavioral profiles you're able to create, do those tend to correlate with any of the psychographic or demographic profiles that we're so used to thinking about? Or do they correlate more with an intent or an interest or a need or some sort of state of mind? Yeah, again, we're super data nerds. So we haven't really uh, connected um, those things, which is if we can tell you um, how likely a population of your user base is to buy or subscribe or whatever it is, um, that's sort of the number one thing. You know, Eventually, we'll get to stitching that together to well, wait. Who are these people? You know, Mm -hmm. these people who convert at 60% versus 0%. Is there anything common about them that differentiates them? Right now, we don't know, um, but it's also not the the number one way to add value for our customers, which is what we're focused on is delivering the the hardcore. How valuable will will this person be in the future? Cool. So what do companies do when they get this data? They find out customer A is a 65% probability of buying something and customer B is a 2%. You know, there's a whole litany of things you said they could throw at it. What do you typically see people doing? Yeah, the number one use case, and and because we work in e-commerce and we work with a lot of direct-to-consumer brands, the number one use case, meaning the, the place people want to point these predictions, this future knowledge, is into their marketing workflow, right? So if you think about it, like besides product costs and sometimes not even, CAC, customer acquisition cost, is kind of the number one line item on the P&L. Of most of most commerce brands, and so when that's the case, if you can add some efficiency to that process, if you can bring down your customer acquisition cost, it can have a really big um, impact on your P and L. And so that's where it gets pointed first. And you know, just to give you a sense of how that works, so we're predicting the future value of every user in real time. It's only we only use first party data, so that prediction that we push back, like an API firehose of predictions, that's also a unit of first party data that the brand owns. And because basically all software, all tools, every part of the e commerce stack is set up to ingest a brand's own first party data, we just push that right into those platforms. And so now, Facebook, for example, which is the biggest place where most brands are, you know, especially direct to consumer brands are spending their marketing dollars. Um, our predictions just show up as audiences right in the Facebook kind of ad manager. And now you know, hey, there's this population with a 
expected 60% conversion rate, reliably so, and another with 2%, as you said, do you want to bid the same way? Or do you want to make sure you have the same share of voice for these two groups and spend your money peanut buttered across them equally? Definitely not, right? And so by just making more rational decisions about your marketing spend uh, in line with the value of these different cohorts, these different segments, you can improve your return on ad spend by you know twenty five to fifty percent. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing, and you That's can phenomenal. also scale up. Yeah. So you mentioned it's a lot of direct to consumer brands currently. Where else yeah. do you see this applying? So really, we think about it. You know, for now, we're hyper focused on on commerce and and DTC. And you know, moving beyond paid marketing, which we're already doing, to expanding the number of of use cases. So we already have uh, customers plugging this into Clavio and Postscript and Zendesk and Gorgeous and Dynamic Yield. So all these places where, as we were saying, if you knew this in advance, if you knew who was who in advance, what would you want to do differently? So that's our roadmap for the next few quarters. But to get back to your question. Really, anyone that has a CAC LTV equation at the core of their business, meaning there's a product or a service or some value delivery at the center, but then the business lives or dies by how much does it cost to bring a consumer to that product and get them to interact or, or buy it? And then what is the lifetime value, right? So how does that customer acquisition cost pay off over time? And so if you think about like, you know, there's so many verticals like consumer financial services, consumer software, education, that um, even healthcare. There are all these places where there's something unique at the center, but CAC LTV is how you live or die. So those are the places where we think real-time machine learning and the sort of predictive power is going to have the biggest impact. I love the way you frame that on the CAC LTV bit. Um, internally at Interplay, we actually, I believe all companies live or die on the CAC LTV. Um, you know, the, there, there's organizations that famously, like direct-to-consumer, pencil and track all of the data. Right? They know exactly what they spend to buy a customer, the CAC, and they know exactly what the lifetime value is, the value of that customer over time. And there's organizations that don't do it, historically. Enterprise software. But at the end of the day, it is quantifiable. And we actually look at this internally when we're evaluating investments. Like we'll see an enterprise company come in. We'll say, great, what is your cost of acquiring a customer? And they'll say, we don't track that. And we'll say, great, what do you spend per salesperson? And they'll say X and they'll know it, right? Fully loaded, travel and entertainment, the whole thing. How many customers does that person acquire every year? And they know that number. Just a little division, and suddenly you figure out, oh, it costs you thirty grand to get this customer, and they usually know the L they can back into some sense of LTV, longer cycles for those. But I, I think it's so fundamental to all companies. I think there's probably, arguably, a bigger trend here, and it sounds like you're well placed for it, where increasingly data driven management teams are going to be looking at that ratio LTV CAC up and down the scale of like transactional sales to field sales to relationship sales and beyond. I don't know if, if you think this has a place in the world of enterprise or not, but. Um, I mean, I certainly hope so. Like the question of, do we focus on B2C businesses or B2B businesses? That was something we obviously thought about and grappled with at the beginning. Yeah. We happen to find a use case in a vertical where the market pull was just so strong. But I mean, I, we think about it ourselves. We're, uh, you know, we're a technology company. But I know when I go to raise my next round of fundraising that, you know, the first thing a, a VC is going to ask is what's your customer acquisition cost? What was your growth like? Yeah. What's your, you know, those things are so fundamental to SaaS businesses, software, like so many B2B businesses and where there's a good data set. So where a lot of the interactions are happening digitally, um, you know, I think our, our predictions will, will work. These concepts were known when I started in VC. 06, 08 timeframe. Yeah. But they have become mainstream expected KPI vernacular. Yeah. I totally Anyone agree. raising money needs to be thinking about this on some level. And you shouldn't just be doing it for your investors. Your investors are looking at it because it's a, a key driver of the success and the health of the company. Yeah. All management should be looking at this in their own accord. If you want to spend yeah. a dollar, you want to make three. It's that simple. Yeah. It's that simple. It's that simple. And if you're not doing that calculus, 
who knows what you're spending? Yeah. Right? Who knows if it's going to make sense long term? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if the if you can't either see now or a path to those sort of micro unit economics making sense, which is like, if I spend a certain unit on sales and marketing, and I don't get a unit out the bottom of that whole funnel that will over time exceed that by some meaningful margin, then it's hard to imagine, well, what, what is this, right? Is this a business or is it something else, right? Is it just a, you know, a product or a feature that belongs inside of somewhere else? Where you can leverage uh, a customer acquisition framework. So yeah, I totally agree. You have to see that that path. Richard, how did you start this? What's your story that got you here? Yeah, so my you know big picture story. Uh, I've been working in software and digital startups um, from the first one I founded or co-founded in 1999. Uh, but this one in particular. Um, it was so. It was a really interesting confluence of things. So, in my last company, uh, completely unrelated to to what Black Crow does, but we had a Skunk Works um, that was helping to solve a you know very different problem, but that was working on predictions. Um, and that team started cracking some very interesting problems. Again, those sort of not widely solved problems, and the biggest ones being how do you do like hyper fast 15 millisecond machine learning how do you do this in such a way that um the prediction is available like the moment it's required uh the moment after some new event or piece of data uh has come in and this is something that you know you may hear about predictions in the uh in the crm world or in, in other places but those are usually predictions based on static databases right like your crm file right if someone purchases eight times, I can reasonably assume that they're high value. Um, but being able to do that, you know, before someone is in your CRM file, right, when they're just some anonymous uh, internet user, that hadn't been solved. And so that was a key unlock that said to us, oh, wow, we actually figured out how to do the data pipelining, what tools to use. Um, and we also started figuring out, you know, where it had been done before. This was done like by one company internally. Um, and the way they would usually work is, you know, and this is the way sort of enterprise machine learning works, is if you're like, some, think of a Fortune 500 company, if you're Pfizer Pharmaceuticals and you decide, I need predictions inside of my company, you'll go out and buy Databricks, which is like the you know privately held but worth tens of billions of dollars uh, sort of ML infrastructure company. Um, so you'll go buy a contract on that. That'll be you know ten million dollars over a few years. You go hire an army of data scientists and data engineers, and you'll start working and building internally on top of these sort of developer tools and data science tools. Those projects, by the way, depending on who you read, Gartner, or Wall Street Journal, they fail somewhere between fifty and eighty percent of the time. But eventually, these guys get there, insane. right? And yeah, it's insane. It's insane. But they get there, and it starts driving these sort of predictive outputs. You know, they're not as sexy as the AI articles you read about, like robots and self-driving cars and computer vision, but they are the thing that is really driving meaningful uh, sort of economic value inside of the very largest enterprises. And so when we took a look at that market and said, well, wait a second, where is, so knowing we cracked a bunch of these problems that would make it um, uh, possible to do real-time analysis, Knowing that the market worked on in this Fortune 500 model, meaning it was just by definition confined to a very small set of, of pretty global enterprises, we said, well, wait, if we built something as good as that centrally, two things. One, could we create bespoke instances of it and deliver mm. it as a service so that you didn't need to do this build a million times? And then second, if we could do that, could we uh, deliver it? And our sort of mission was uh, for less than the cost of one data scientist annual. Mm. And so some of those problems we were working on in the skunk works uh, inside of my last companies before starting Black Crow, we knew they could be solved, right? Um, and so we had a, an incredible head start um, getting Black Crow up and running because we knew they could be solved. But it also helped us clarify the mission, which is the Fortune 500 is going to do things one way. 
but the rest of the market, this, this thing needs to be democratized, right? Everyone needs the, the stuff I just described to you about real time predictions and using it all these ways. Amazon's doing that because uh, they built their own system. But the middle of the market, you know, think direct to consumer brand, a Shopify store with 20 or $80 million of, of GMV. Why shouldn't they have access to that? Um, why shouldn't they be served? And that's what we set out to do at BlackRock. That's amazing. What are some of the companies using you guys now? Because you've brought this service downstream, so it's not going to be all the IBMs in the world. Who else is touching this? Um, meaning our customers or who yeah. else is in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we work with a lot of uh, brands that you may know, uh, brands like Farmer's Dog, Cotopaxi, uh, Daily Harvest. So a lot of like folks who have a really important direct relationship with their consumers. They may be selling uh, more one-off goods or maybe more of a subscription service. Um, but there are people who are very much, uh, you know, focused on acquiring customers efficiently and then making sure that that relationship that they start is as valuable as it can be. You you mentioned a lot of very forward thinking marketing organizations, often venture backed. Yes. Are you finding that, you know, more traditional marketing teams are, you know, maybe more dormant brands are grabbing onto this concept too? Or is it just yeah. kind of the frontier, the innovators? I'll be honest with you. So we're, we, we've started with sort of the avant-garde or the, yeah, those folks who are a little more digital native, they get this immediately. Like they know that they're living in time by the calculus LTV equation. As you mentioned, not everyone has sort of fully digested that, especially in, in more legacy businesses. Um, so, but that's a function of not whether we can add value or not, but really whether who's going to have a fast sales cycle, who's open to testing and learning. Um, and the fact is, you know, even for those brands I mentioned, we work with lots of other ones, you know, like Majuri or Magic Spoon, you know, but companies who are, who are uh, very forward thinking. Um, but the interesting thing about this is, even though they're forward thinking, we're selling machine learning to someone who ultimately doesn't give a crap about machine learning, right? What they care about is the outcomes, right? Can mm -hmm. you deliver value? And so that's why, you know, we made it so easy, right? I mentioned it's a one-click install. So this three-year, $10 million Databricks project has turned into one click. And then the model builds in two weeks, no work required. And then we just let our, our potential customers use it for a month. No obligations, no money changes hands. So you, you, everything we build delivers value in 30 days or less. That's one of our missions, uh, as well as being able to do it for you know, less than the cost of a data scientist. And when those two things hold, um, it's a pretty compelling it's a pretty compelling proposition, and certainly for the avant garde. But I think will be uh, elsewhere. And I should say we have some very large um, and medium sized multi channel retailers who have been around for a long time who are seeing the value in this as well. Do you think this tool scales to be an enterprise solution, or are there things you need an enterprise that are never going to make sense in kind of a productized SaaS solution? Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's an interesting question. We, as you well know, um, just finished fundraise, I don't know, seven, eight weeks ago. And it was a question that almost every investor asked. And here's what is interesting. It, certainly there is a set of Fortune 500 um, who are doing this on their own, right? That's why Databricks is worth however many billions of dollars. Um, but there are many large companies who are kind of nowhere on this front. And the question is sort of like, can we deliver value? There, I'm very confident that the answer is yes, right? There's not that many companies who are doing real-time machine learning. There just aren't. Um, our, our real, uh, the only question we have about it is, is the go-to-market at this stage for our business going to be a sustainable one? You know, sales cycles are longer. There's a mm -hmm. lot of compliance and et cetera. So we'll get there eventually. But for right now, like, in the it, just thinking like middle market e-commerce companies, 20 million to a billion of GMV, there's 40,000 of them in North America, which is often a wow. surprising number. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to focus there, uh, learn a lot, and then we'll figure out what's our approach to enterprise. But Why certainly in terms of value delivery, I'm, I'm confident. This seems like such a no-brainer. And I, I, I know the sales cycle is very short for this, for the, as you said, avant-garde, the, the forward-thinking tech folks. Yeah. Um, 
what do naysayers say? Why do people not buy this? This seems like if you're moving a product online, it's a must have. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, our conversion rate, once you get someone into a trial, the, the people who say no are, are very small, right? It's, you know, um, single digits, low double digits of people who get through a trial, see the value and are like, eh, no, it happens, but um, it's rare. It's really getting people to take that first click and to mm -hmm. run the one month um, trial. And there, there's a whole range of things. You know, the biggest one is like, this sounds too good to be true, um, which is why we developed the whole, you know, just use it for, for 30 days, see for yourself. Um, there's a lot of resourcing um, constraints, meaning I know it's only one click to integrate, but I don't have the team right now that has the bandwidth to make sure that this test works. Um, but ultimately, and we've seen so much of our business comes from you know, word of mouth and people on in the uh, marketing channels of D2C companies. And the more proof points we get out there, the more sort of logos we can put on our website. I think we're starting to maybe crack through a little bit where a lot of brands are thinking, ah, I think we should try this. And I do have this sense that I'm sitting on a gold mine of first party data that I'm not leveraging. And um, especially in the face of, you know, there's been so much turbulence in the iOS. Uh, uh, landscape the way you know people can use their own data outside of their own environments that's prompting people to say okay i need some solutions here so before this i, I know you did intent media you also did travelocity you were there for yes. a while in a senior executive role yeah um and that's obviously a famed uh tech company uh in the in the first lap here of what was like the big internet boom yes uh any any stories or nuance from that experience that kind of informed your view of the world today? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Travelocity, now owned by Expedia, uh, there's been a lot of consolidation in travel. Um, but my path there was was super interesting. The, I was part of a uh, one of the co-founders of a startup called Site59. Probably haven't heard of it. It was a travel technology company. And we were working on the problem of, this was like 99, 2000, working on the problem of distressed inventory in the travel industry. So how can you let suppliers use pricing as a demand stimulant without completely crashing their, uh, their economics, right? Where everyone just waits the last minute and buys the cheap flight. Um, so that business, Site59, grew like a rocket ship and um, was uh, we sold it to Travelocity. This would have been... 2002, 2003. And we thought, you know, we had some amazing tech. Um, we thought they would integrate our technology and fire us. We were a bunch of 20 somethings in New York City. And uh, it turned into quite the opposite. It was, it turned into a minnow swallowing the whale, actually. So our team ended up taking over and running Travelocity. Um, so we went from being part of this 100 person company in New York City to running this multi thousand. Uh, person publicly traded uh, entity, but, but literally, you know, the CEO, my co-founder Michelle Peluso uh, of Site Fifty Nine became the CEO of Travelocity. I ran a two billion dollar piece of the business, but our CTO, our uh, head of Europe, our general counsel, like, so we were just running this thing, and it was a real culture shock to go from a little startup to a a big uh, global company, but it was. You know, it was an amazing experience. Uh, it was a bit of the Wild West uh, early on in the first dot com wave. Um, and it was Texas, not New York. They're based in South Lake, te Texas. So I spent a lot of time there. Uh, but it was an amazing, amazing experience. How does that work? How do you go? How do you deal with being an agile small team operator to wading through mud? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is the, the it's it's the question, isn't it? It's sort of how do you bring that sort of very lean, uh, fast pivoting, agile mindset into large organizations? And there's an entire you know multi billion dollar consulting industry built around doing just that. And Travelocity was big, but it was also part owned by Saber Holdings, which is even bigger. Mm -hmm. Saber being the company when you go to the airport and you see. Um, you know, the gate agent type encrypted things into a green screen, that's Sabre behind the scenes is sort of uh, 
inventory management and and uh, booking solutions for that all over the airline industry. Um, but any like real best practices on like yeah we showed up and it was mud and here, here's how we got a shovel and made 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 it work or and anything you learned? Yeah, I mean, radical prioritization, mm-hmm. um, building trust. Um, and this is, I used to be a consultant actually at BCG and that was a similar case where it's like, you know, young whippersnappers showing up all bright eyed, uh, with big ideas. And it's very easy for the BCG client or for an acquirer, um, to say, you know what, we've seen all this before, all of it before. And you guys think you're, you know, discovering America here, but Here's all the reasons why this won't work. But I think if you just radically focus, build trust with where you're trying to create change and get people used to a test and learn mindset, which is like, okay, I don't need to change the whole company strategy, but what small thing can, is safe to try that we can test and then iterate on? And once that starts becoming um, part of the company culture, that's the path to, to larger change. So is Travelocity like the PayPal mafia where there's a group of you and you're still doing deals together and it's kind of like a, a secret club? Is that, is that <laughs> happening with Travelocity? I mean, I feel like um, all of the old school big names, they've got, they've got that connective tissue floating around. For sure. I mean, it is um, the, the gang at Travelocity is an incredibly talented group. They've now spread out uh, all over the place. I was just having drinks with Sam Gilliland, who is uh, uh First, the CEO of Travelocity, then the CEO of Sabre, and gone on to do all kinds of uh, wonderful things. So we do keep in touch, um, and uh, a lot of folks are out doing really cool stuff. That's awesome. So you mentioned consulting. Uh, I think consulting kind of lends itself naturally to what you're doing now with Black Crow. Uh, what, what is, how would you describe the consultant mindset or worldview at its, car, at its core? I mean, there's a lot of people I work with who have come from other great industries, banking, other corporate startups, um, and find themselves in these really agile, complex business d- dynamics. Yeah. I feel like there is something about the consulting, like Jedi mindset, that is super useful in those worlds. What is yeah. that? It's a good question. Um, and I was, I was just interviewing uh, an ex-BCG person today for, we're doing a lot of hiring at Black Crow. You know, I think it's, it's at its foundation, you don't do anything for very long when you're a consultant. You know, at BCG, you would have a case that would last from maybe three to nine months. Um, and then the next thing you do might be in a different industry, a different geography, completely different set of problems. And you know, this is changing a little bit in consulting, but back when I was a consultant, we were all kind of generalists. Like there were no super pigeonholed uh, people until maybe you were a partner. And that meant that you needed to be able to super quickly get up to speed on like a whole industry and a whole company and the competitive environment. And you needed to start formulating and testing hypotheses very quickly. And so that mindset is not a fortune 500 mindset right like how do we how do we kill ourselves before before someone kills us and that is the what what we were just talking about like we've seen all this before it being a consultant is the opposite of that right you need to go in understand assess develop hypotheses and iterate and i think that's that's a lot more like what a startup founder is doing that's right like what insight can i have about this industry or something that's broken uh, in the world. And how can I pretty quickly get up to speed on the environment? Not so much that it makes me cynical or unable to think, you know, laterally or creatively. And then how can I start iterating on solutions? How can I, in a very low cost, low risk way, start figuring out how to solve these problems? So maybe that's why. Yeah, when I hear you talking about it, what I hear kind of undertones of the scientific method. Yeah. Right. I feel point. like may- maybe there's some bridge from kind of the scientific method which drove the Renaissance and everything else to what the consulting mindset is. Why maybe we're seeing so many entrepreneurs from consulting backgrounds 
I love right? that. They're I love trying that. to rethink, I think that's right. test hypotheses, know that they know nothing, but try to frame and make decisions. Yeah. I think that's so right. It, it is the scientific method. Um, and yeah, the Renaissance, think of how much creativity and, and you know, ferment came out of uh, that period. And I also think, you know, there's another interesting thing, which is, you know, the bar is pretty high, you know, at a McKinsey or a BCG or wherever, like the bar is pretty high. They hire really good people. And then the people who self-select out of that into an entrepreneurial environment have everything we were just talking about in terms of, you know, agility and mindset. And then they're also like, but I don't want to be just be an advisor. I want to control shit. You know, I want to be in charge and build a culture and all that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that combo I think is is pretty powerful. Like you've got the toolbox and you're not satisfied satisfied being an advisor ultimately. So it's interesting. I know earlier before today's conversation you had mentioned that you're a machine learning guy and I'd come in thinking you're a marketing guy. But I want to talk to you about marketing. Sure. Um, you know, 3 years ago, maybe less. Uh, when someone said they were going to do digital marketing, it was synonymous with ad buys on Facebook and Google. Apple, m- probably most significantly, has made some real privacy changes. Yeah. How is the marketing game evolving? Where are dollars going? Are there places where there's kind of fertile ground for yield now? Sure. What's the new landscape? Yeah. So you're right. Like the, the, uh, advent of ios 14.5 which is sort of uh, a little over a year ago that was kind of a watershed especially for for brands and companies that had grown up with basically infinite cheap supply of social media specifically facebook and instagram advertising that if you kind of crack the code on that you could build a brand right it was the cac ltv equation kind of worked um it had been under siege and there was a lot more competition and customer acquisition costs started rising through through the pandemic sort of 2020 2019 and on uh but then ios 14 was a real just off the cliff moment and you know parts of this are a good thing for the industry meaning the the parts of apple's moves that really are about data privacy uh i think are great um most of what apple is doing is not about data privacy it's only about securing privileged access to that data for apple and not anyone else um but to the degree there are incremental improvements in in privacy uh it's good what now what's that what that has meant for brands is a few things um as regards the facebook the meta uh sort of ecosystem um it's meant that what you do spend there needs to get much, much more intelligent and effective over time. A big part of that, which is you know what, what we do with brands, is leveraging first-party data. Because a lot of these privacy changes were meant to attack this whole sort of ecosystem that existed of third-party data and data brokers and people in the you know the ads following you around the internet that sort of like but where did they get that data and people were buying and selling and cookies and blah blah blah. so that thing had been under attack through privacy legislation um it continues to be but that is um that ecosystem is what really has has been under attack a brand's ability to use its own first party data really will i think always be there meaning the ability to understand your users, your customers, and to build relationships with them. And so in practice, what it's meant is you got to get much more intelligent in how you spend inside of the meta ecosystem, much more uh, focused and predictions are a great way to do that. But then also you need to diversify a ton, right? And so um, that's happening first with social channels. So we see almost all of our customers saying what used to be a 99% Facebook budget is now a Facebook and TikTok and Snapchat and Pinterest and let me look at less costly search channels like Bing and let me look at Reddit and newsletters. And so all these things that you could be a little lazy about in the past when there was so much cheap Facebook inventory, you can't be lazy about anymore. So it's putting a lot of pressure on marketers to find ways uh, 
uh, uh, to work more efficiently. What opportunities does that open? Are there new technologies that you think are now necessitated that no one needed when it was just kind of a one channel game? <laughs> yeah. Two I mean, channels? I think so for sure. Um, I think, you know, I was just talking to a great company this morning called, uh, replay, uh, it's R-E-P-L dot A-I. And they use computer vision to break down video and help you understand as a brand what in your videos, whether they're like video ads or your organic TikTok feed, which elements are working versus not working. And so I think like for me, so much of this, and I fully acknowledge my that I see everything through a data lens. But a lot of this is going to be about brands getting their data house in order, meaning their first party data and their zero party, party data, the data they own, which customers willingly hand over through their interactions or filling out forms or whatever. And it's just not going to be an option to be on autopilot, right? You need to take all of the understanding you have about your customers and make sense of it and activate it. And so those are the big those are the big things where I see the industry focusing and activating it can be anywhere from like creative optimization to better real-time decisions where we play um, to many, many other pieces of the organization. But, but data is the key understanding what's actually going on. Now your, your solutions focus on SMBs. What are the big companies doing? Like you mentioned Apple. Um, one of the reasons they put some of these Roblox up is to leverage the data for themselves. What, what, what yes. angles do they have with that? That's going on behind the scenes because it's it's definitely billed as a privacy protection maneuver. Yeah. What's it what's the underlying story is. here? Yeah, so so there's a few different things, right? Um, so Apple, when you when you look at what they're doing, uh, many of the uh, prohibitions on data use that apply to everyone who's not Apple are different from the access that apple has and so if you think about you know there's only a few companies like facebook and google and apple there's probably a few other uh a few others that your digital life which is becoming an increasingly large portion of your total life your digital life is happening through them right um when i interact with the internet it's almost always through chrome if i'm on a desktop i happen to be an android guy so another google touch point but for many people, it's through an Apple device. And that means that you kind of can't get into your digital life without passing through them. And so Apple sees all of this. And they've stopped, in some use cases for some data, letting um, anyone outside of that Apple wall use all the data that they see, but they don't restrict themselves from using that data. And so, for example, Apple has a pretty giant uh, ad business. Um, they haven't ramped that at the moment um, uh, to be as large as it could be, but they don't place the same restrictions on themselves that they do on others. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a story here where Apple is the next channel for, for your, your customer oh, acquisition. Oh, 100%. It will be. Where are those ads going to show up? And what, what medium are they going to start putting ads in? Or is it more I integrated? Like, this is the app we recommend yeah, it's, I mean, it's so many things like the app store um, is, I think it's largely going to be about mobile. It's largely going to be in the app store. And the ways in which Apple facilitates monetization inside of applications, that would be my, my bet. Um, there are other, you know, there are other contact points that Apple has, obviously, like Apple TV, they're creating their own content. Um, they're developing cars and VR glasses. And so there's going to be a lot of ways where it deploys, um, where it deploys this understanding of Apple users, some of which will be advertising, some of which will be uh, all the various ways uh, you can make money once you understand uh, the intimate data patterns of a human. So flipping over to the other side of, of your brain, the machine learning side. What does that industry need? I mean, you're knee deep in it. You, you made the point that kind of real time aspects to machine learning is fairly new and certainly not widespread. Where is that technology going? What, if, what should people be building to help, you know, garner the movement? 
yeah bolster the movement yeah so there's sort of like there's two big themes that we operate on and that that i think are broadly true um and the first is democratization right so if you think about the various um the waves of technological innovation that have happened say over the last like thousand years or two thousand years most technology tends to create differences between the rewards to capital versus the rewards to labor meaning um you know a farm implement or a tractor right all of a sudden if you invest in a tractor the returns that you can get in agricultural output versus you know a farmer they start getting really you know an individual farmer with a, a hoe they get incrementally out of whack and i think ai is one of those tools where the returns are going to be so incredible they already are and so we just have a belief that it's not a great thing for the economy uh, or the world if all of that value gets concentrated among a very very small set of of enterprises meaning if google owns ai or uh, apple owns ai or facebook or whoever it is um that won't be a great thing and so or amazon so a big focus of what we're doing here is democratizing ai right making machine learning accessible to people and companies where it wouldn't normally be accessible and so that's what you know as much as we're innovating technically we're also democratizing technically which is we want to make sure this just doesn't all sit in a a handful of of global players so that's one. Oh yeah did you have a no great keep going it's awesome okay um the other one and this is a little more abstract but it's sort of like what we're building for as a company um which is if you think about what we're doing today right we are we work with a commerce company and we're predicting the future value of all their users in 15 milliseconds right that is the, the key source of data is that brand's website. You know, it's it's the browser, right? It's the browser. And so today, browsers, browser data, app data is a perfectly good analogy. Um, that is this source of streaming real-time data. But I sort of think where there's tons of value to be generated. But it kind of feels like the world is becoming a browser. And I don't just mean like, oh, we're all going to live in, in the metaverse. But I mean, everything is starting to kick off real-time data in the same way that a browser does and has for you know 15 20 years um now if you think about like the internet of things and wearables and rfid tags and sensors and video monitors like everything is becoming a source of real-time digitized data and the thing about data is like it's really cool to have it but it needs to be made sense of. And that's all machine learning is. It's making sense of vast quantities of data. So anyway, when we think about like, what is Black Crow in, you know, seven or 10 years, like, because that's our goal. We want to build a big, a big, you know, sustainable company. It's really like, well, if the world's becoming a browser, it's going to generate all this data. The data needs to be made sense of. We want to be that company that's making sense of all this streaming real-time data. I love that. You've got a lot of optimism. Uh, especially going into this market cycle. Now you've you've been through three of these downturns, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> right? You've yes. been in the entrepreneur game yes. for a while. Any advice for founders that are kind of right in their first wave here um, on how to navigate this moment in time? Yeah, I mean, it's hard and I've had the luck or unluck. Uh, I don't know which it is to be sort of in the middle of founding a business during, you know, the first dot com September 11th crash and um, the global financial crisis, and then the you know COVID plus now the current uh, sort of financial market correction, hopefully. Um, and yet, there, you know, there's one like super practical thing and one sort of like intestinal thing, right? And one is understand that that these are cycles and if it's your first time in the game and you've only been in the you know 10-year bull market that we've uh, been experiencing this is this is the normal part not not the fact of a downturn but the normal part is that shit changes on a dime 
right? Like what ebullience turns to dread uh, very quickly and fear, you know, can rapidly follow greed. And so that's the number one thing is like, expect this cycle. And if you were lucky enough to launch a business in 2013 and exited in 2019, great, but you haven't seen the whole story. Um, and the second is, um, be pretty opportunistic about capital. So, I mean, everyone is saying this right now, but if you, if you're existing investors want to pony up a little bit more, so you have a bit of cushion, um, uh, so that you're not forced to make, um, existential choices, um, too early. I think that's great. And then the second is, and having been through this, um, I've been in places where we had to make cuts and super difficult choices. And I'd say, you know, there's never a scenario I've been in through a downturn where anyone at any point for any, you know, I know lots of different founders when anyone says we cut too much and that may sound brutal from a, a human perspective. And, and it is no one likes doing this stuff. Um, but it's always surprising when I've been or watched colleagues in those situations where they had to make cuts. No one's ever regretted cutting too much because it drives a certain hedgehoggy, scrappy mindset. Um, that's good. How do you stay sane through all of this mentally? I know you've, you've done work to find inner peace and Zen and all the other things that go out there. But how do you, how do you level out through the roller coaster? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't, I, as you can probably guess, I'm a super hyper rational um, person with one asterisk, which is that, um, and I don't want to get all woo woo here, but, uh, yeah, I, I meditate. Um, I actually lived in a Buddhist monastery, um, for a few months in Northern India, actually in Bodh Gaya, the town where the Buddha reached enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so what's super crazy about I forget whether Buddhism is your cup of tea or not, but I think everyone has at some point encountered the wisdom of like, you need to appreciate the now, right? The power of now living in the moment, you know, being present in the present. And that's sort of like sort of folk advice at this point. And it's actually true, right? There's something incredibly calming and focusing about being present in the, in the present moment. And yet, if you're an entrepreneur, particularly a tech entrepreneur, you do not live in the present. You, by definition, live in the future, right? Like, what have I been talking about? The world's becoming a browser. Like, like you're thinking about the future. You're thinking about what your P&L is going to look like in six months, next quarter. You're thinking about where the capital is going to come from next. Like, you literally plunge yourself into the future as a career. And so, those two things are super unaligned, you know, misaligned. Um, I can't, I don't want to offer any like, uh, uh, particular advice, except that I do know, um, meditation and trying to sort of be present even for relatively brief periods, periods of time helps. It grounds you. It's like, it's sort of like looking at the ocean. It adds perspective to everything. And for even just a few minutes, it sort of takes you out of the worries of of the future i think you really nailed the entrepreneur mindset pretty well right we're frantically running through for something that's it's like this never-ending treadmill because we're always yes. building something that's not now yeah um been a personal journey for me to be very present yeah any particular How do you do it? oh i'm not the guy getting interviewed here i mean let's be honest no i'm kidding no i do um i do meditation as well uh, I also try to integrate, I kind of meditate a little bit through exercising, different program, mm -hmm. but I try to do both of those. Um, for those to, who have an Oculus at home, I think the Trip app, if you're not really a natural meditator, is a great hack. Mm -hmm. Eyes are open, um, kind of gets you in the mood, calms you down, and brings you to the now and present. So I'd recommend that. It's T-R-I-P-P. -P. I think it's venture-backed, okay. which makes me want to support it more. Um, so, uh, any tactical things you do, like, is there a frequency to your meditation or any bigger moves? Um, it's as often as possible. I, um, 
I, there's a, an app that I use called Waking Up. It's uh, mm-hmm. Sam Harris's app. And there's an initial, I think, like 50-day class where it's just like if you can commit to 10 minutes a day. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, even for someone who'd been doing this for a while, not not consistently by any stretch, but trying trying to get back into it with with consistency, I thought that one uh, was great. I've used that too. That's a great app. Highly recommend. Yeah. yeah, very cool, Richard. Thank you for being on today. Thanks for making time. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed the conversation. What I loved about this conversation with Richard was talking about the data side of the world. You get a different lens of all the big business we're all consuming in the news. By thinking about how data is being used, you're thinking differently about market trends, business decisions, and otherwise. Uh, he had some really interesting topics, and I hope it will, hopefully it was interesting to you as well. If you liked what you heard, please hook us up with a like or a five-star review, and feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter, at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any major podcast platform. Just search for innovation with Mark Peter Davis.